Well, good evening and welcome everyone to this uh, seminar on the Beijing 2022 Olympic Games, which are just uh, over the horizon. They begin officially tomorrow, but actually they've already begun with some of the events that we've seen, including Paris curling and already some ski events going on in Beijing. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Timothy Sisk. I'm a professor uh, here at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies and uh, also the director of the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies. So very pleased to be here co-hosting this event with my colleague, uh, Swishing Zhao, who is the uh, director of the Center for uh, China-US Cooperation. And we're co-hosting this event uh, together uh, on the eve of the Beijing 2022 Olympic Games. And uh, the goal here is very much to provide some insight into the complexity of the Olympic Games happening in China, happening in 2022, happening amidst the global pandemic, and also occurring at a time of deep polarization and enmity in the international system, uh, rivalry and power rivalry over contexts like Ukraine and the South China Sea. So, you know, to provide some insights into this complex global event, uh, we here at the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies together with our China Center at the Corbell School and to put on an event where we could provide uh, hopefully some insights from uh, an esteemed group of panelists who follow these issues on sport, not just about politics, but sport as an international issue. You know, sport is one of those uh, aspects of our 21st century human condition that, that spills across boundaries uh, like climate change, like migration, uh, like pollution spills across boundaries can't be managed by states acting alone. And so we have this whole architecture of, of international sport that includes the International Olympic Committee, the United Nations, et cetera. So we wanna provide some insights on this and uh, to offer um, the opportunity for our audience to ask questions of really top uh, experts on a range of issues. Uh, so what I'd like to do is to first introduce our panelists, um, and then with your indulgence, I'll make a couple of scene setting remarks of my own. And uh, not to worry, I only have a couple of PowerPoint slides, but for those of you who may know me, um, uh, I've uh, had the great fortune of over 20 uh, plus years or so teaching a course here at the Corbell School on Sport and International Politics. It has the subtitle Prestige, Profit, and Peace, and looks at all these issues uh, from both a scholarly perspective and also a practical perspective. Uh, so I'll set a few, I'll set, I'll make a few scene setting remarks that I hope will be helpful putting these Beijing 2022 20, games in context and then go around to our panelists. But first, let me introduce them because we have a fantastic set of panelists with, uh, with us here this evening. And I just couldn't be happier to introduce to you uh, Connie uh, Carpenter-Finney as if she needs an introduction for most of our uh, viewers. Uh, Connie is simply one of the most uh, distinguished Coloradans uh, whom, uh, of whom I know, and particularly one of the most distinguished Coloradans of my own uh, generation. Uh, this is a person who spent their life breaking barriers, uh, beginning with the Sapporo Winter Olympic Games when this, uh, a, a very uh, a young uh, athlete at 14 years old competed in speed skating and went on to win 12 national championships uh, in the United States and, and switching over to women's road cycling. And, you know, we know uh, in the history books and for all time, and you can see it at the Colorado uh, Sports Hall of Fame, that she's the winner of the first women's road cycling race in the Olympic Games at 1984 in Los Angeles, a 79.2 kilometer women's road race, the very first. And now, you know, as in terms of breaking barriers, I think um, we're so pleased to have uh, to have Connie here. Connie is also a board member, of course, of the Davis Finney Foundation, uh, founded by her and her husband, Davis uh, Finney, uh, for Parkinson's research. And we're so pleased 
uh, to have uh, Connie with us this evening to provide insights really about, you know, what's most important in these games, uh, which is, you know, the courage and capacity of these athletes who are doing phenomenal, uh, phenomenal things and breaking their own barriers. Um, also, please, I'll just go in the order of their speaking to tonight um, to introduce my friend and colleague, Cullen Hendricks, uh, who is a professor here at the Corbell School. And Cullen uh, is one of the, if not the top global expert on the nexus between climate change and conflict. I could point you to his book, uh, aptly titled Confronting the Curse the international political economy. I'm not exactly right. The economy and geopolitics of natural resource governance. I hope I got that right, Colin. Thank you. But one of the top specialists here, uh, Colin comes to us with a PhD from San Diego, uh, University of California, and also a BA from Kalamazoo, Michigan. So I know Connie being originally from the Midwest, we have a slight Midwest theme here too. Uh, let me move along to introduce my friend and colleague, Suixing Zhao. Um, again, we're so fortunate uh, on this panel. We have, uh, I believe, the top specialist in the United States on uh, matters pertaining to China. He's professor and director of the Center for China-U.S. Cooperation at the Corbell School and has been for 20 years. He's the editor of the Journal of Contemporary China Studies and is the author of numerous books and articles on almost every aspect of China uh, that one can imagine. I think my favorite book of my colleague is a, a Stanford University Press book titled China a nation state in construction. So thank you, Sui Xing, for being here. We're looking forward to your insights uh, on, uh, on China and on these games. And, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Nicole Johnson. Nicole is an MA a student in international human rights uh, at the Corbell School. And uh, yeah, she's in my current course on sport and international politics. And uh, she is a uh, services coordinator at the U.S. Center for Safe Sport here, uh, right here in Denver, Colorado, kind of right behind me, if you can imagine that. Um, and uh, among other things, uh, Nicole is a gymnast and a coach uh, in gymnastics and comes to us with a BBA in sports management from University of Colorado. She's also the author of a 2020 uh, publication on uh, safeguarding sport and preventing abuse in sports. So when I have a moment, uh, I'll drop into a chat for everyone here, or otherwise we'll uh, provide a link to that uh, to that article. So thank you to my fellow panelists. Let me move right along in the interest of time. Uh, I'll, I'll just take uh, uh, maybe uh, one or two minutes of your time at the very most uh, to share with you uh, just a couple of initial uh, thoughts about uh, how we interpret these Beijing 2022 Olympic Games. Because I'll be fully honest, I'm, I'm of mixed emotions about these uh, Olympic Games myself, uh, having been a very close follower of the Olympic Games, and especially since I was 12 years old watching those Olympics in Munich, Germany, I've been fascinated by the Olympics and, and by Olympic history. At the same time, I have deep concerns like we all do about whether our watching uh, people jumping and skiing and you know, Nordic skiing and biathlon uh, sets out uh, somehow contributing to, to uh, the legitimacy of a government which is uh, accused of atrocities. So look, there's two perspectives and maybe we're all a little um, perplexed about the Beijing Olympic Games, but that's because there's two big perspectives on international sport and its relationship to politics. And one of them is it's kind of a tough world out there, and it always has been. And ever since 1896, when the Greek uh, athlete won the marathon and, and the king of the time, who, who was a Dane, uh, ran down onto the field, waving his hat, ran the last lap uh, with the athlete. It's always been about the legitimacy of the ruling regime when an Olympics comes to town. And often these governments, like we've seen, look at their own society as somehow being, you know, important or superior, be it communism or capitalism. And, 
And the games have always been used uh, for participation and, and to punish. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the work uh, that we might refer to would be on the boycott against apartheid South Africa, which began in 1960. And we can go back to some of the work of George Orwell uh, to say, well, you know, does sport contribute to peace? Eh, not so much. It's about nationalism and national identity. And, you know, some of these little examples I have here, you know, were from different moments in history when the Olympics uh, have been held in post-war London in 1948 in the wake of the bombing of London or in 2002 in the wake of 9-11 or in Sochi in 2014 where according to the initial medal count, the Russians topped the medal count. So we have this view of sport as just reflecting international politics. But there's a different point of view, and that is that sport can contribute to peace. And we had just yesterday, the government of Kenya asked for a truce in Ethiopia during the Olympic Games to try to facilitate that peace process. We've seen linkages between sport and human rights, uh, all the way from abuses and atrocities in the, just before the games, like in 1968 in Mexico City, and during the games even in Mexico City. Breaking barriers, yeah, there's our photo of uh, Connie uh, Carpenter winning the 1984 gold medal, breaking gender, equality barriers and uh, expanding access to sport for women. And we think about the role of sports contribution to development um, and the sustainable development goals. And then in my own work, I'm very interested in how sport contributes to peace. And I think sport contributes to peace from the bottom up when it helps develop positive youth attitudes and attitudes of tolerance and understanding. So as we go into these Olympic games uh, in Beijing, I hope that may be a little bit of useful uh, framing, but uh, enough of me, let's turn to Connie. And uh, Connie, we really look forward to your remarks and your insights right here on the eve of the Beijing Games. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, thanks to everybody for Listening in tonight, it is an exciting time for me. I always get excited uh, with every Olympic Games and every Olympic Games that I can remember have been fraught. Uh, Nicole, I want to tell you that I wish safe sport would have been around when I was competing. <laughs> it certainly wasn't. And even as recently as when my son was competing in uh, the last three Olympic Summer Games before um, Tokyo, he competed in Rio. London and Beijing, and I saw things there that, um, you know, made me question what we were doing uh, with our young athletes um, at the Olympic Games. His first games, he was 18. My first games, I was 14. And uh, it's not, uh, you know, nowadays with the professionalism of sports, I was a complete amateur when I raced, uh, of course, as a speed skater. Um, and then even as a cyclist in 1984 and the Olympic Games themselves were amateur. And so they've changed so much over these last, you know, 20 years. And I've seen um, a lot of injustices, I think. But, you know, I wanted to start, I've been working on a memoir and I wanted to start and just take you back because I am, I am possibly the oldest person in the room here. I competed in the Sapporo Olympic Games 50 years ago almost to the day. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of water under that bridge. But, you know, when I when I look at the Olympic movement and try to assess, you know, where, um, where do I fit in? Where do my values come from? And, and what was it like back then? So take us back to even before, uh, as you referenced, Tim, even before the games in Sapporo, we had, um, the 1968 games in Mexico City. And I did a lot of reading. I've, I've been able to, to meet the you know, gentlemen who were responsible for the, the, the protest uh, in my course of travels. But, but even more interesting to me was the fact that there's so many, uh, we've, we've made such a gross mischaracterization of what they actually were standing for you know, and, and, and what it meant. It wasn't a political statement, in my opinion. It was a human rights statement. They stood up to speak out against poverty for Black people in America. 
That's what they stood for. And so much of what we've seen when we see two black men standing on a podium with their arms raised with a black fist, we don't understand that that the where the black fist came from, why they came to the podium shoeless, you know, to represent those people that they were speaking up for. And if we can't be in my own writing, I said their silent gesture was a shot across the bow to the Olympic movement. What defines politics? Civil rights, human rights, they should be apolitical. So that's a big topic tonight, right? Is whether or not human rights are political. I, on the other hand, when I competed in the 1984 Olympics was really a pawn in the Cold War. I, we, President Reagan was, uh, had been governor of California and really wanted the, the Soviet Union to attend those games, despite the boycott that had occurred in 1980 against the, the games in Moscow, which I'm sure you've discussed in your classes and most people can remember. Um, Nicole, you might still not have been born then, <laughs> so maybe not. But you know that boycott happened um, at a time when athletes were strictly amateur. And so to deprive the US team of their ability to go and do what they'd been training for on their own dime for the most part, was really against all, um, all of what I held true to be about the Olympic movement, right? Because that was political, you know, that was political. And that was, you know, motivated by Russia's, uh, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan. But in 1984, when the Russians decided, the Soviet Union decided not to come to uh, LA, it wasn't a tit for tat kind of a deal, that's my technical term for it. Um, it, it was actually predicated in a very complex Cold War situation that dated really to just 365 days before the games and had everything to do with the fact that, um, that the Soviet Union shot down Korean Airlines jet 007 which had gone slightly off course and was in Russian territory, thinking it to be a spy plane because we had been engaged in spy games in that part of the world. And most people don't know that. And they don't know that because Reagan's letters were kept you know, sealed for 25 years um, after his presidency. And they were only released you know, in the last decade. And I found a, a wonderful PhD dissertation that outlined this step for step because I saw the film Icarus and I hope most of you have seen it. It's one of the most important films ever made, not because the gentleman in question had decided to, um, ever made about sport, I should say, um, had decided to um, engage in doping practices, which unfortunately tarnishes all endurance sports and particularly my sports, but because of Grigory Radchenkov, who was the, the Soviet doctor who was responsible for the doping in um, the Sochi Olympics and did seek refuge in America, but revealed throughout this story. And I learned from Brian Fogel later, the director and writer and the main star in the, in the movie who had actually attended the Carpenter Finney bike camps in 1986, <laughs> that he, um, that actually it was so much more complicated. And he learned that um, it wasn't even just the Cold War. It was also because Grigori had come to the 84, uh, he had come to LA before the 84 games to see how advanced the doping um, anti-doping testing was. And he found out that yes, in fact, almost all of their athletes were gonna be busted during those games um, because of their doping practices. And so the, the president of Russia at the time who was, I have to remember this because Brezhnev had died and I'm not that good, but <laughs> with some of my history was Chernenko had, uh, had actually wanted to have a, a, a aircraft carrier, a Russian aircraft carrier of some sort or military vessel parked off of the Long Beach um, Harbor. And there the Soviet athletes were meant to stay supposedly because they were being threatened by anti-Soviet hostilities. But in, in reality, what they wanted to control their athletes and do extra um, anti-doping testing. And so none of this was revealed to me in my case, as an athlete in the 1984 Olympics, I had to keep my focus. And when you ask me, what are the athletes thinking when they go to Beijing? They're thinking about their events. They're thinking about their focus. They, they're thinking about what they can control, which is waking up 
trying to do their best and, and getting through and actually not testing positive for COVID. <laughs> you know? I mean, this is the most fraught games we've ever had. Um, even worse, I think, for the athletes than those in Tokyo. And uh, my son's girlfriend was in Tokyo. And I know those games felt very odd. Um, but they carried them out, you know, pretty successfully and not with this other overarching, you know, feeling, this sense that, you know, Russia, is, or not Russia, excuse me, that China is, um, is, is it, that they're bad, you know, that, that their regime is bad, that they're too oppressive. And the athletes aren't thinking about that when they're in Beijing or they're trying not to until they're asked about it, right? And so I think that um, one of the things that we have to consider when we think about the athletes when we start to talk about boycotts is that you're, you're now making the athletes your pawn when you start to talk about that, right? And those that ship sailed when the Olympic Committee, International Olympic Committee offered Beijing um, you know, the opportunity to host the games, right? And it's not something that can be decided in those last minutes where you take the rights of the athletes completely away from them, even though we're talking about greater human rights, because I don't know that the intended outcome would would occur. So that's kind of my Randall, rambling discourse on my history <laughs> and what I bring to the table, because I've been through a lot of confusion myself, and I've seen a lot of disappointment, um, especially through those athletes that were forced to boycott in 1980 and those lost chances um, that they had. Um, so in my opinion, uh, we've got a lot to learn and I'm really interested in hearing what everyone has to say about this tonight because your opinions matter as well, of course. Wow, Connie, thank you so much. And I know um, all of us are will be eagerly awaiting your memoir, probably like you are too, <laughs> like uh, getting it done. And uh, we'll really look forward to it because, you know, I'm uh, like you, I'm of a generation. I remember these events and in 84 in Los Angeles and, uh, you know, that Cold War era and what like sport was like in the Cold War. So this is going to be a real contribution and, and we're going to look so forward to that. And uh, let me turn to Sui Xing. I think uh, Sui Xing, one of the things I woke up to this morning was that, you know, photo of uh, President Xi and President Putin walking arm in arm uh, there in Beijing. So, yeah, there's something to uh, thinking about this uh, from a point of view of international relations. And, and you're really um, uniquely uh, a um, place to uh, give us insights. So I'll turn it over. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, very gracious. And uh, also it's a great honor and a great uh, pleasure to join, uh, join you to sponsor this event uh, with the Tim's uh, Institute. And uh, uh, the job I'm assigned is to talk about the Chinese thinking of uh, the Olympics, not my personal uh, uh, thinking. But before I get to that point, I want to give you a small number here. That is uh, the U.S. team, Connie talk about U.S. team, member of U.S. team. This year to Beijing Olympics uh, uh, are 225 athletes. Among them, 26 are from Colorado, including one from DU. So uh, we are very proud of Coloradans. Uh, this morning, I in fact uh, heard NPR uh, talking and uh, uh, interviewing uh, one athlete from Colorado. She arrived in Beijing and was very impressed uh, by the quarantine and by the test and by what she talked about the bubble there. But that's a, a different story. But uh, tomorrow uh, is a big day. Uh, for those ethnics. Uh, in fact, uh, from yesterday, the torch rene started from Great Wall of China um, uh, by the vice premier uh, of China, Han Zhen. Now they are going through all those uh, historical sites in Beijing, uh, uh, eventually ended in the next stadium. And that was the stadium for 2008 uh, Summer Olympics. And uh, so these events, uh, from Chinese perspective, uh, has been, I mean, since 2015, they got that event, has been in preparation 
for quite a while. And uh, the Chinese leaders are very anxious to have that for their uh, uh, regime uh, legitimacy as a in the uh, eyes of the Chinese people and uh, to show the Chinese uh, um, people uh, how they could be proud of their leaders uh, to uh, bring this uh, game to China. In fact, the Beijing would be the only city in the world that has host both summer and winter Olympics. That's, only, that's what they said, the Swang, uh, Swang Ao, uh, both Olympics in the one city. It's a, a big deal for the Chinese uh, propaganda to talk about that uh, and uh, to also show the world uh, China is not only a rising power now, China is a big power. China has uh, regenerated from those dark days of the century of humiliation. Chinese people had a very strong those kind of sense of uh, past uh, uh, darkness and current uh, power and uh, recognition, respect by the international uh, community. And uh, for uh, uh, Xi Jinping himself, I think he has insisted uh, these Olympics would be held on time because uh, 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 in Tokyo last year, uh, uh, in 2000, uh, and because of the pandemic, it was postponed one year. In fact, in Beijing, I heard there were also some kind of discussion, even a debate among Chinese uh, officials and scholars should Beijing postpone this to next year. And uh, that um, pandemic will be uh, uh, over. Xi Jinping insisted, said we have to hold that this year to show how good we are. He, he used that in one person life, how many times, how many opportunities you have about this type of occasion, you have to fight to win. That's what he talked about. So it's an opportunity for him and for the Chinese people to show China has emerged, to be able to uh, overcome all those barriers, all those problems to uh, host a very successful and splendid, splendid, and also in their words, safe, and also a, um, uh, economy, it can, not that kind of uh, spend that much money of uh, Olympics. That's what they talk about. And, uh, and also from Xi Jinping's perspective, uh, uh, this is also, I'm also for Chinese people, not people. It's also opportunity to show a real China to the world because of uh, uh, Xi Jinping himself last uh, uh, seven years, eight years, he has been very proud of uh, the accomplishment of the eradication of poverty. Not only lifted uh, millions of people out of poverty, he have eliminated absolute poverty in China. So that's what he accomplished. He talked about in July last year, uh, the first stage of the China dream. China dream has uh, two stages. Uh, one was uh, the, 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 the centennial of the, the uh, CCP, Communist Party of China, was born in 1921, so last year was centennial. The other uh, stage uh, will, will be 2049. That was a 100th anniversary of the PRC. So last year he announced that has been uh, uh, accomplished. And also for him, Another thing I heard, I mean, listening to the Chinese propaganda now talking about that he, want, he wants to develop winter spots because China has been very weak in the winter spots. Even among uh, winter spots, he talked about, I mean, maybe in the ice spots, China was okay, but in the snow spots, China is far behind. So this opportunity, China has 1.4 billion population about more than 300 uh, million people living in the north of China. He thought that is opportunity for these people in the north of China to develop interests and skill in the winter spots. That's why uh, this, 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 spot, this, uh, this game is hosted by Beijing, not in the Manchuria, I mean, northeast China, because he wants that part of the uh, middle of China, get more people to see they could be involved 
that is what the, the thinking of the Chinese leaders and the Chinese people. Then the second issue I want to discuss here is that, uh, but not the people you talk with Chinese people, they are very concerned about a lot of issues now they have confronted. Two issues I think most uh, obvious uh, for the Chinese people. One is the pandemic. Uh, during this kind of a situation, uh, it's beyond Beijing's control. So uh, no country would want to welcome thousands of uh, visitors uh, to visit their country in this situation. Japan postponed, as I mentioned, that for China, a lot of people in China concerned how China could guarantee these uh, um, Olympics, when the Olympics, the ethnic uh, safe would not become uh, a spot of uh, outbreak. So that's a big concern for the Chinese people, especially in China now, they have a so-called uh, zero COVID policy. Uh, outside of this uh, uh, bubble, uh, they thought they have been successful in control that, control of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the pandemic. So, so many people came to China, could they handle that successfully? The second obvious um, barrier for them is this international geopolitics, as Connie and also Tim both mentioned, which is also is an expected and also unexpected. In fact, the you read Chinese uh, uh, media, you can find out uh, they are pleased that uh, most of uh, international co corporations have not been uh, uh, deterred uh, from uh, uh, endorsing the Olympics. But in the meantime, the US and a few Western countries have declared so-called the diplomatic uh, uh, boycott. And uh, that is uh, somehow for them a, a, a unhappy uh, situation. Then facing these two, what they see barriers or difficult situations, their responses, that third point I want to make, has been very hard nine so far, very hard nine. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, when US uh, announced so called diplomatic boycott, the Chinese foreign minister, ministry uh, sp spokesperson said, You are not invited at the first place. And uh, so the Chinese leaders are very clear that uh, uh, we are not concerned. I mean, they are concerned but they try to show to the world now it's not 2008 when the China hosted the Beijing Olympics, Summer Olympics. They were very concerned, the human rights groups, uh, Western countries, they want to show China uh, uh, is emerging of isolation and uh, willing to work with uh, other countries. This year, I think China's attitude is somehow very different. China is no longer, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, rising power is for them is a global power. Accept it or not, that's your problem. It's not our problem. Wang Yi, the foreign minister, he said the pressures uh, will only make the Chinese people more united and confrontation will not stop China from becoming stronger. That's what he said. And uh, Xi Jinping himself also, he said, will never allow any foreign force to bully oppress or subjugate us. Anyone who would attempt to do so will find themselves on a collision course with a great wall of steel forged by over 1.4 billion Chinese people. That's what they talked about. Very, very hostile, very, very aggressive on these issues. And also the Chinese, uh, you can see Chinese side of those, uh, I read those social media, all those things. Chinese people were very angry at Americans, at Western powers. They really think the Americans have an evil intention. Americans do, do not want to see China's rise to be happy as a peer power. US would do whatever, whatever China would do would not please America, just like US did try to suppress Russia, suppress other countries US does not like. So 
they are very, very um, happy. And also they see US has hypocritical because uh, you are criticizing Chinese side of human rights issue. They thought US has now more problems than China. You talk to those people, they said, in my personal case, you are in America, the most dangerous place in the world because uh, the, the, the number of the cases of, of a pandemic, the gun violence, the anti-Asian racism, and uh, so many other issues, divide society, these kind of uh, political infights, all those things, they thought America is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, hypocritic. And uh, uh, in this case, in fact, China has uh, not invited that many foreign dignities from very beginning. The most important guest, as uh, uh, Tim mentioned, is uh, Russian President uh, uh, Putin. And uh, uh, it, not only you see the, um, uh, the photos, they are together. They are talking about how they could work together against the US in Ukraine and many other issues. And uh, there are only 20 somewhere uh, head of states sitting tomorrow together with Xi Jinping. And most of, I mean, almost all those countries are poor countries and authoritarian countries. So this is uh, something for the Chinese side to see a divide world. The development country, countries, uh, authoritarian countries in competition with so-called liberal democracies. And for them, they could win. In fact, uh, since in my own research on the uh, international stage, human rights, uh, uh, US Human Rights Commission, China concept of human rights development rights in, instead of civil rights have winning over those developing countries. They very often put democracies in a minority of voting blocks. So that's the fighting there. And there are many other is, uh, interesting Virginia, issues. I, but we, uh, I try I to want to be talking on time here just a little bit. Uh, so we, um, I, I uh, hesitate to interrupt, but we um, maybe you've got a quick uh, wrap up comment and we can move along uh, to Nicole. Just want to be sure we keep to our time frame here for the Sure, week. sure. I, I'll just uh, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, finally here, uh, China has tried to show for this uh, in response, uh, their new technology, their hospitality. I was going to show a uh, uh, video tape how the robbers, uh, China has uh, all those uh, uh, videos now uh, released, the arrival, arrived uh, ethnics, how they have been impressed by those high-tech uh, uh, facilities, everything. And also I give you another number of China is rising also uh, a number. Uh, Two years ago, China's GDP was 70% of US. And the, during the pandemic, China is this year, January last month, 77% of US. China think when China GDP overtakes the US, US will not in position to sanction or boycott China. Boycott China. China will be on the other side of uh, in the game. And uh, another number I want to give you today uh, is uh, I read today, uh, China hockey team. Uh, among 25 players, 18 were born or grew up in North America, or both, went from Russia. And you can see, all, they give all the names. I think Americans might be uh, familiar with uh, goaltender Jeremy Smith and Canadian and defenseman Ryan Sproul, all those people, they give those names. So China is no longer, from their perspective, uh, China uh, in Western countries saw 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or even 50 years ago, China is totally different anymore now. now. So China is hosting this game in a very different scale and also different positions. I'll stop here. I will. Uh, we can... Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I think it's really important that, you know, that we hear this perspective and and uh, that we understand, uh, as you say, I sort of feel a bit like uh, your remarks reinforce what uh, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said about the diplomatic boycott. I was like, I didn't really uh, have the option of offending China in terms of the global system. 
uh, at the moment. I mean, it just wasn't on. But Mr. Guterres, I don't believe, will be giving a statement in uh, Beijing. So I think this is an interesting kind of thing for us to watch. Let's, let's shift the level of analysis here, and we're going to come back to China. And uh, like all these uh, Olympic uh, issues, we're torn, we're flipping back and forth. That's just so well. And as you may have seen in the chat, I got the sequence wrong when I introduced everyone. Our, our uh, uh, schedule has us going next to Nicole. So, Nicole, we'll all, we're all ears for your presentation. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm really excited to be here with such experts in the field, and I feel like there's so much we can talk about on China, the intersection of sport and everything else going on. So really interesting to hear these different perspectives. Um, as Dr. Sisk mentioned, my academic and professional interests are in non-accidental violence in sport, particularly sexual abuse in sport. And so a really interesting fold in the controversy surrounding the games and please bear with me as I work to share my screen, um, is the case of Peng Shui. Perfect. The case of Peng Shui, um, the Chinese tennis player who was described as missing for a period of time in November 2021 um, after she made a post online accusing a top Chinese official of sexual assault. That post was removed 20 minutes later, and her name was made unsearchable via Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. When people and NGOs worldwide began to express concern for Peng Shui's safety, they uh, had a video call with the International Olympic Committee's president, Tomas Bach, to quell concerns um, when she had reappeared a few weeks later, and she retracted her statements regarding the sexual assault. Um, and although the silencing of Chinese people who spoke out against the Chinese government was a typical practice in the lead up to the 2008 Summer Games in Beijing, it was especially concerning to see the IOC's willingness to be complicit in the Chinese censorship of Peng Shui. The International Olympic Committee really believes deeply in the power of the Olympic Games to rise above politics. They see themselves as completely apolitical, despite the number of political demonstrations that have taken place at the Games over time. Um, and I think that this behavior really brings to mind um, sport organizations like the National Basketball Association, who have deep ties to China and have built a mon and monetized a massive fan base in China and thus discourage prominent NBA players and their owners from speaking out in support of the advancement of human rights in the country. We saw really swift and severe Chinese action after Daryl Morey, then with the Houston Rockets, tweeted in support of protesters in Hong Kong, and after Ennis Conter, freedom of the Boston Celtics, repeatedly spoke out against the Chinese government on a number of issues online and even during NBA games. The NBA loses millions of dollars every time they upset the Chinese government online. Um, and that is definitely in the calculus of the IOC, the Olympic Committee as well. The IOC and the Chinese government pledged in the 2008 Summer Olympics um, that this would really improve human rights in China to, to have the bid for the 2008 Games. And even when China didn't uphold that promise, the IOC didn't have any disciplinary procedures in place. And I think it's really unlikely, despite the continued human rights issues, even human rights issues that have continued um, and, and are still relevant from the 2008 period, that we're not going to see any type of IOC interference in these games, um, which I think is especially concerning that the commercial investment in the games has um, come at the expense of legitimizing harm against athletes like Peng Shui, and human rights violations in China and beyond. More broadly, sexual, emotional, and physical abuse of athletes and the responsibility of governing organizations like the IOC has become a major topic in international sport in the last several years. Uh, while re more research really needs to be done in this area to have a greater idea of the scope, the IOC's own consensus statement on sexual abuse and harassment um, gives prevalence rates between 2 and 49% for sexual abuse and between 19 and 92% for sexual harassment in sport. And while sexual assault in the case of Peng Shui 
and sexual abuse like that of the now hundreds of gymnasts in the United States are often the stories that get the most attention. Uh, it's really, in the literature, it really speaks to a greater um, likelihood that emotional and physical abuse are really, are really prevalent. We're looking at 75% of youth sport participants. Um, and with that, um, I think that it's important to note that there is an increased risk of harm for people who are in racial minorities, people with gender identity and sexual orientation minorities, and athletes with disabilities, especially prevalent or rather relevant with the Paralympic Games being held in Beijing as well. Sport really sees itself as this autonomous body accountable to no higher power. And sport govern governance organizations from the IOC, individual international sport federations, and each country's National Olympic Committee have generally been unwilling to support necessary reforms with regard to policy, education, and response mechanisms on the issue of abuse. The conversations about safeguarding and subsequent policy reforms have really been due to brave athletes like Peng Shui who have spoken out often at the expense of their own safety, the future of their athletic careers, and in spite of the great societal stigma that we attribute to issues like sexual assault. Uh, if the International Olympic Committee truly believes that international sport mega events like the Olympic Games and the Olympic movement at large have a moral value beyond that of a strictly commercial entity, they should invest in and encourage accountability mechanisms and transparency throughout the movement. And we've seen a little bit of this in the realm of anti-doping with organizations like WADA, um, but I think that they have been reticent, um, in particular the IOC has been reticent to encourage evidence-based policy improvements regarding abuse prevention and response. And when I say evidence-based policy improvements, I mean things that should be relatively easy for international federations and the International Olympic Committee to implement. These are things like pre-employment screenings for people involved in sport, training and education on abuse prevention, and codifying acceptable and unacceptable behavior in a sport environment so that you can then hold people accountable via disciplinary measures. All things that seem simple in theory, but are made a lot more complicated when you consider that in almost every country besides the United States, the government is running their Olympic committee. So it's hard to imagine China, Russia, or similar governments getting behind independent mechanisms for abuse prevention and response. The United States has made some strides in this area in the last few years with the opening of the US Center for Safe Sport here in Denver in 2017 and congressional authorization for the center to be the nation's safe sport organization in 2018. The center combines the preventative measures um, and case management measures that I showed on the last slide into one organization. And so we will take allegations of abuse and misconduct throughout the US Olympic and Paralympic movement. And then additional departments are meant to strengthen the capacity and policy application of the 50 plus national governing bodies of sport in the United States. Since opening, the center has really received over 10,000 reports and trained over 2 million people, um, which is great. Um, although 10,000 reports really indicates a broader issue beyond American sport. Other countries have worked to establish their own independent safe sport mechanisms with really significant strides in countries like China, Australia, and Singapore. And I think while the center can serve as a model for what could be possible in the International Olympic Movement, it seems very unlikely that there would be universal support or application for independent mechanisms um, if we don't get the support from the International Olympic Committee. And if their treatment of Peng Shui is any indication, we have a very long way to go before the IOC is doing their part to keep sports safe. Nicole, thank you so much. Um, I think as soon as I can get my jaw off the floor from the rate of prevalence of abuse in sport, oh my goodness, 70%, 75% in that UK study, 
Uh, and so um, I really appreciate it. And I think for everyone uh, on the event, you can see why we love our students so much. Um, it's a fantastic presentation right on on the key issues. And you know, when, when Connie mentions the sort of doping issues that occurred, um, there was an institution created globally, WADA, to address that. And you know, Dick Pound uh, and others, you know, really pushed that effort to create a, a, an international institution to manage these issues. Let's go to our last uh, speaker um, and then come back around around the panel for comments. I would like to encourage anyone uh, on the webinar today to go ahead and put uh, your Q&A into, uh, if you have any questions of these esteemed panelists, I've got a whole handful, um, but if you have questions, please put it in the Q&A and uh, we'll look forward to sharing those with the panelists. Let's go to uh, Professor Cullen Hendricks. Thank you very much, Tim. And I've learned a, an incredible amount uh, from the previous presentations and they've set the table so nicely. I had a lot of comments prepared but many of them have already been preempted or dealt with in much more detail than I was going to go into. And so for that reason, I'm actually going to focus on just one kind of relatively narrow question that I think arises out of the current geopolitical moment we find ourselves in. So given all that we're seeing, given this talk about a great wall of steel forged by 1.4 billion Chinese, and uh, given all of the tensions between the United States ranging from the US-China trade war, uh, to uh, tensions in the South and East China Seas, to uh, the human rights situation in Xinjiang, you know, are we really going back to, you know, the Cold War dynamics of the 1980s and one of Connie's kind of several heydays as an Olympic athlete? Um, you know, that was, that was a decade that was characterized by these kind of dueling and, and, and infinitely more geopolitically complex uh, boycotts uh, than I had realized. Thank you, Connie, for uh, educating me on that. Um, and, you know, that was, that was a time of intense geopolitical competition. Um, I think that the answer is, is basically no, at least in the medium, a short and medium term. And the reason is this, is that the situation, frankly, is now just a lot more complicated because of the nature of the global economy. Um, Nike was not selling over $8 billion of products a year in 80s Soviet Union. Uh, Coca-Cola wasn't moving billions of dollars in Coke and Sprat products in the Soviet Union. Uh, and the United States was not importing hundreds of billions of dollars of goods that are key to global supply chains and are key inputs in the many consumer products that are made here in the United States from the Soviet Union. The dual trading systems that prevailed during the Cold War, where we had this kind of liberal economic order led by the United States and, and, and Europe, uh, and, and then the Soviet bloc kind of Comic-Con countries, it meant that the economic impact of these kind of boycotts were rel was relatively muted. I mean, you know, U.S. sponsors were, were sure miffed that they weren't going to be able to make a lot of hay out of the 1980 games in Moscow. But, but you know, that's a relatively kind of smaller price to pay, given the, the nature of the, the kind of massive economic relationship that prevails today. You know, China and the United States are, 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 are each, you know, each other's some of their most important trade and investment partners. And for all the real talk you're hearing about decoupling, uh, especially coming out of the Trump administration, and really picked up a lot in, in sort of tenor for, by the Biden administration so far, China seemingly being one of the last kind of bipartisan issues uh, in US politics at this time. You know, China is still this vital component of these supply chains for all sorts of products crucial to keeping the US economy going. I mean, I think we all remember kind of the great personal protective equipment shortages at the beginning of, pand of the pandemic. That is just one example that kind of highlights the dependence of the United States and its economy and frankly, the safety uh, of, of its citizens and, and residents on products being imported from China. And, and you know, the Xinjiang region, which you've heard a little bit about and the human rights abuses that are occurring there, um, it, it, you know, it, it has a very, very important role in the global economy. It accounts for about 20% of global cotton, which means it has a larger market share in the cotton market uh, than, than Saudi Arabia does in the oil market. Um, and so for all these reasons, I think that this situation pre presents itself as very potentially fraught geopolitically, but there really are a lot of things pulling in the opposite direction because of the level of trade and investment integration has occurred since the end of the Cold War that you know, for, for a lot of the, the kind of the political posturing and the rhetoric, which is indeed heated, there's a lot of sort of money on the table and a lot to be lost uh, dis it, with major disruptions to those kind of relationships. Moving forward, I do think that there will be somewhat more of a bifurcation, a divide into several different kind of uh, economic sort of zones of influence for these kind of major economies. 
But I don't think it will be anything nearly as stark as, as the one between the United States and Soviet Union. And therefore, I don't really think we're back to precisely Cold War dynamics uh, in the global economy. Thanks, Tim. Well, thank you, Colin. Reminds me of a really nice little book uh, called Michael Jordan and the New Global Politics, I think it is. But it's all about the advent of uh, satellite technology and the uh, change in China from that. And we've seen, I think, from Swishing, the growth of the middle class uh, often leads to uh, to to uh, advances and participation in sport. And so there's a lot of deep uh, drivers going on here. So we've had a fantastic set of presentations. I think, Connie, at one point, I may have seen your um, the race hand feature up. And so I wanted to turn to you if you had any comments or thoughts back on any of the other panelists or other things. And um, then we got a couple questions in the chat, but would also encourage anyone to toss in additional questions uh, in the uh, Q&A feature on Zoom. Connie? Um, I don't remember if I put my hand up, but I have been just totally fascinated by everything. And uh, Su Xing, especially your um, uh, education of us, of how the Chinese people are perceiving Americans, which is so important for us to know and to learn more about in order to understand, you know, where where we fit in in this dynamic, um, as well as, you know, what they're trying to, to sell, so to speak, because all of the sports movement is selling, right? We're all, we're selling, you know, world harmony or, or p possibility, potential, um, you know, human capabilities. So I, I, I think it's interesting, too, to see that that they're more interested in developing their Chinese athletes. Um, and I, I guess I had a memory I just wanted to share because when I was speed skating and I was a teenager traveling around in Europe, um, going to events and it was the first time that some of the Chinese came out of China to actually speed skate at some of our events and they were actively giving us the Mao pins, you know, to wear. <laughs> and I had, you know, I didn't know anything about uh, Mao actually, I was 15 years old and, um, and it was just, you know, it was a moment where at the hotel where we were staying in some little town in Germany or something, there happened to be a table tennis, um, you know, rec in the rec room or, you know, and we all played together. And to me, the naive sportswoman of my age, that was bonding and we broke down barriers because, you know, I couldn't have looked more different than them. Um, and I couldn't have come from a more different background. And there we were trying to play table tennis with each other, you know, and so I would go back every time to the personal connections that are made in sport to say that those are among the most important. And if and if all humans on the planet were able to have those experiences across boundaries and borders, I think we'd be better off because we'd understand each other better. So more of a statement, I guess. <laughs> Well, thank you, Connie, for that statement. And, you know, it's, I think it's my own personal experience. Like, well, how did I get into the stuff on sport and international politics? And it's that, you know, in my life, uh, also in, in living in other uh, societies and contexts that really uh, social integration occurred through sport that I got to know people, I have a lifelong friends, and the way that I got to know them was through participation in sport. That leads me to some of the... Um, work uh, that we're doing at the Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies on social integration of new uh, Americans uh, here in Colorado. And I think, you know, taking that uh, lesson about social integration through sport um, and uh, uh, looking at the, the ways that social integration can be bettered in Colorado is an important thing. Let me go to, um, in terms of moderation, we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So I'll just go back to the order of speaking here. Um, and I've got, a, a, I'll, I'm gonna combine a couple of questions for you, Shui-Shing, if it's okay. Um, we're very interested in, um, you know, like as we look at Qatar coming up with regard to the FIFA World Cup, we see that a lot of like state-owned enterprises are involved and you know, that there's this close relationship between the government and economics. And, and I sort of wondered uh, how does sport fit into the, the notion of Chinese development? I think that's one question. And, and then there's another question too that I thought they're, they're not particularly related, but maybe maybe you'll be able to relate them, which is, 
And there's a lot of concern about US athletes and their um, digital privacy and that COVID app uh, uh, that they're required to get. But also I think some of the statements by Chinese officials, you know, trying to deter that, uh, um, that those kind of athletic protests that Connie mentioned uh, happened in 68. And so what's your take on, uh, on these kinds of things? Um, uh, both the uh, kind of role of the Olympics in the Chinese economy, but also some of these practices of the government. So, <clears throat> me? Oh, okay. Yes, that's uh, let me uh, share uh, a video here, if I may. You watch that? Do you hear? At the 2022 Winter Olympics, China has vowed to safely host the February Games in Beijing. These guys are part of that effort to ensure social distancing for athletes and guests. Here in the main press center, journalists arriving early for the Games were greeted by something of a novelty. Instead of canteen staff, food arrives from the ceiling and even food like burgers are being prepared electronically. It doesn't stop there. Elsewhere in the media center, a robotic arm is serving up cocktails. You can make over a dozen recipes and takes just 70 to 90 seconds to measure, shake and serve. Human bartenders are also on duty to lend a hand if that antiquated human touch is ever needed. It may not be service with a smile, but robot room service is at least social distancing friendly. This is one of the official Olympic hotels in Beijing. Guests type a pin code in to access food. Another attraction at the press center, a robot serving up ice cream. To buy the sweet treat, one must go to the cashier to pay first and get a receipt with a QR code. Machines can turn out plain vanilla with options to add toppings like Oreo cookies or chocolate chips and different flavor sources. Uh, well, thank you, Swishin. I think that says uh, that says a lot about uh, the Chinese economy. High technology. And, uh, what I want to show yeah. here is a technology China. Let me get. Uh, yeah. Here, uh, in terms of the two issues, let me get the second issue first. Uh, uh, the information uh, control of China. I think that's mostly for the Chinese people. Uh, China has built a very powerful firewall, try to control what Chinese people can uh, and learn about the outside world, the, how they think. For the foreigners, I think of what I heard, the whole uh, uh, Bible, uh, bu bubble of uh, the, the closed loop bubble in the uh, uh, Olympic villages is uh, totally open in terms of uh, internet, you can just, uh, just like you're in the United States. And uh, the, also I have another uh, 30, 30 seconds of video showed the gift uh, uh, package to every athlete arriving in Beijing, including when uh, uh, I think uh, $1,200 uh, cell phone, Samsung cell phone, very fancy, you can fold that, very fancy, cell phone. Most ethnics were wow about them. I don't think they worried that much about uh, about uh, stealing their uh, information because they are there are only yeah, a few yeah. days. So I don't think those uh, ethnic worth that much for the Chinese government to get their information. Maybe for those uh, uh, Chinese ethics competitors, they might want to get some information, but that's not only China. Any country does that. So uh, for this type of in, uh, information uh, control, I'm not quite uh, convinced that's the issue here. In the West, it's always issue privacy issue, I understand it. In terms of uh, SOE, uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, for uh, all those sites, they are 
built by those SOE, state-owned enterprises. Uh, they are now very powerful in China. That's the priority of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, economic development strategy. So I don't know how much money they can make for this this year because of they don't sell those tickets and they only get those money from the endorsements. The money they spend for these facilities, I think most for them showcase of their uh, products. And uh, I don't think it's for profits here. Yeah, thank you so much for saying very, very interesting. Uh, and of course we'll see if there's athletic protests. We saw that, we saw that in uh, Tokyo, we had a defection, a uh, Belarusian athlete. So I think um, you know we'll wait and see. And to me, I think it's a very interesting to see the extent to which uh, we have this kind of tension um, between the IOC Rule 50 on athletic protest and uh, and, and some of the statements about uh, um, potential punishment for protest. We'll see how that plays out. But I've got a question for Nicole. Nicole, you mentioned that you know the IOC has adopted new human rights related guidelines but it was too late for the Beijing bid. And we go back to that and think, well, what if it'd been in Almaty, Kazakhstan? That's another story, huh? Um, because that was the other contending city after Oslo and others turned, turned the IOC down. Um, but basically I'm, uh, I'm wondering, I don't, uh, and, and if you don't know, it's okay. I was just wondering what this may portend as we look ahead to, um, uh, to Paris in uh, 2024 or uh, Milano, Latrocino 2026, et cetera. Um, is this the last of what we'll see as far as the uh, IOCs uh, kind of jumping in with regimes with uh, less than stellar records? I would hope so. Um, and I think it's interesting that the agenda 2020 that included those new human rights reforms, I believe that was. Um, brought to the table in 2015 and maybe ratified in 2021. But I, I don't know that there was maybe a reason why we couldn't have implemented those for this games other than bureaucracy. Um, and maybe again, not wanting to, to ruin the relationship, the commercial interests with China as they relate to the games. Um, and I think the IOC has a fairly easy time ahead of them in terms of host cities. Um, there's always issues with displacement of people who live close to um, where the, the events will be taking place. And that is something that has come up both in France and in uh, Los Angeles. There have been, you know, groundswells of activist support on those issues. And so it will be interesting to see how that plays out, although I don't think they have a true test until we have another country similar to China who has not had um, positive movement, shall we say, in the field of human rights. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicole, very nice. And I would say that the United States will sort of know how it feels when the spotlight turns to Los Angeles in 2028, right? I mean, no country is perfect and you host the Olympic Games, you're really putting yourself out there very much similarly in France uh, as we see. So fantastic, thank you for that. And uh, Colin, we had a comment in the in the Q and A, which I think is a really good one. Which is, you know, we kind of been there before on this question of of nationalism versus like interdependence. And you know, I I, I think you're right to make the case that interdependence, you know, kind of kind of keeps these things at a rhetorical level. Um, but in the past, maybe we've been wrong on that, and that nationalism trumps uh, economics. What do you think about that one? No, I thought that was a really, really good point because the, the point was made, you know, like, we, you know, on the eve of, of the First World War, no, you know, sort of eggheaded, geo, you know, student of geopolitics like yours truly would have been saying that it was likely that it would be very breaking out because the, the economies of Europe were, were quite highly integrated. Um, so what's different now? Well, there, I think that there are, rel there are two things that are different. I won't say that there's everything different, but those two things uh, you know, are, are both important. One of them is the different nature of production in the global economy now. Um, so at that time, what you had was more or less kind of trade in goods that were finished goods at the time that they were arriving at the border, you know, so, you know, French cheese being consumed in Germany and German automotive, you know, automobiles being purchased in France and that kind of thing. I mean, it was that kind of trade where you, you basically had gains from trade and then also the kind of uh, trade that occurs when you have sort of regional variation in specialties. 
Um, the global trading system now looks a little bit different because there's a lot of intra-firm trade, right? And, 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 and trade between, so that's trade within firms operating in several different countries. Um, and then you also have trade between firms that are part of the supply chain for a finished product, right? That's the thing that links sort of the United States, uh, China and Taiwan uh, into the iPhone and, and other kind of like products, um, which raises the stakes pretty considerably because you know, the, the countries of, of, of the, you know, the major economies of the world are just much less self-sufficient than they would have been in previous eras because of the change in the nature of global production. And then the other one, you know, if I put on my kind of old, you know, historical IR hat, um, what I would say is that, you know, the nature of kind of the alliance system, right? And all these hidden alliances that were tripped by this series of dominoes that were kicked off because, you know, an assassin got lucky and got a shot at redemption and a second shot at, Arch, at Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand, right? Um, that set of dominoes doesn't exist in the same way now that it did then. There's a much better understanding of what the military alliances are, what the likely blocks would be to emerge. Uh, and both of those things kind of augur towards stability. Now, having said that, um, you know, this is, I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to be sanguine about this. I think that we are entering, you know, the most intense kind of period of major power geopolitical competition, um, at, at least in, in, in my adult life. You know, I, I, I'm 44 years old, which means I kind of established the lower bound Right in terms of age for people who are kind of politically aware, you know, uh, you know, and, and we're conscious of, of global politics at some level, you know, at the, during the fall of the, the, the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And so for that reason, I do remember, you know, the final stages of the Cold War. It does feel more like that than, say, the last couple of decades have felt. Um, in the political sphere and in the rhetorical sphere, it doesn't feel that way in the economic sphere. And I think that that does carry some weight. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Cullen. Um, well, we've got two minutes left. So what I'd like to do, I might surprise our panelists a little bit, but I'll talk for a second so they can gather their thoughts. But I thought we might go around one final time and say, well, what's the one thing you're looking for in uh, Beijing 2022? You know, either good or bad or one thing to remark. And so I don't know, I hope I've given you enough time. I know Cullen's adept at this, so maybe let's go backward and that way we'll give Connie a moment to, to collect her thoughts on the topic. But Cullen, what are you looking for in Beijing 2022? I am looking for uh, Michaela Schifrin to continue her dominance in the downhill and I wish her the best of luck. If you're watching, Michaela, I'll, I'll eat burrito pasta with you anytime. Fantastic. Thank you, Cullen. Nicole? I'm really looking forward to watching the figure skating events um, and more broadly, I know you said one, but I think it will be interesting to see what amount of athlete activism actually takes place, whether that be on the medal stand, comments online. Um, it will be interesting to see because there have been some calls um, both in this country and abroad to, you know, in the interest of protection, not speak out. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And I even uh, read there's a suggested salute. I won't say it. I want to give anybody's ideas out there, but you could probably Google it and find it um, as to, you know, the exact protest symbol uh, that uh, they're supposed to use in this case. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. I'll let people look that one up. Swishing, uh, the one thing you were looking for, Beijing 2022. Uh, some human rights uh, groups uh, have tried to persuade uh, the Western ethnic not to take photos with the Chinese ethnics. I hope they will. That's what I look for. Ah, because people, the people, ethnics to ethnics, they are very different from governments to governments. Great cultural appropriateness. Thank you so much, Beijing. Very good. Uh, Connie, your thoughts on Beijing 2022, your things you're looking for? Well, knowing some of the athletes that are there, I'm really hoping that every one of them gets their chance to participate. And that's mostly under threat of a COVID positive. So, uh, you know, I'm only wishing for the, the best success and the best, you know, um, opportunity that they might have. And I'm also hoping that we're not fooled uh, as a viewing audience and that we do get to see some uh, honest glimpses of what it's like to be there and what it feels like to be there. Um, but in this world, uh, getting that authentic view is uh, 
probably not going to happen. And it will be whitewashed the way so much um, has been in the past. Um, to all of your points this evening, I think we all realize that uh, at the same time, um, you know, go USA and go, uh, go, go to all the athletes. Really, that's what I, what I say. Fantastic, Connie. Thank you so much. Um, you know, what I'm looking uh, for is the uh, freestyle skiing. I'm, I love to watch it and it's great. And we've got a fantastic athlete uh, competing for China. I mean, grew, grew up in the Bay Area. To me, I think, you know, kind of almost in a person sort of personifies this uh, question of uh, China and the U.S. maybe reinforces not just at an economic level, but at a very human level, our connection across across countries in this world. So I wish her well. And, you know, I'm I, like everybody, you know, hoping for the team of my country, but, you know, I'm really hoping for uh, those scripted moments in the Olympics that can symbolize hope and can symbolize uh, goodwill and peace. So thank you to all of the panelists. It's been a fantastic seminar. Thank you, Connie, Swishing, Nicole, Cullen for these excellent remarks. I also want to thank in the background, uh, Dustin uh, Allred, the program manager at the ICROSS, uh, and uh, Anna Metropolis for her deft uh, managing of the webinar. Thank you very much uh, to them. And uh, Swishing, your Chinese uh, noodles uh, video has, has made me hungry. Uh, so with that, I'll return the webinar. And again, thank everybody for coming. It's a fantastic event. Thank you, Connie, everyone else. Thank you so much. All the best.